on today's episode of Revive Our Hearts Weekend. You know, we tend to think if the things outside of me, if the external circumstances in my life would change, if just this would happen, then I wouldn't feel so much in turmoil inside. I realized when I was in anxiety, I was creating losses that had never happened. I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, how can I walk through this? It's very hard. Welcome to Revive Our Hearts Weekend. Thanks for joining me. I'm Dana Grash. This month's theme at Revive Our Hearts is overcomers, and that's because we want to help you be an overcomer. Jesus wants you to be an overcomer. A few weeks ago on this program, we looked at overcoming selfishness. Last weekend, we explored overcoming distractions, and today we'll talk about overcoming anxiety. And if you're struggling with anxiety or stress, you are not alone, my friend. About 30% of people say they're facing some kind of a chronic battle with anxiety. Could be panic attacks, or maybe they're obsessive compulsive to some degree, or maybe they are experiencing some really lethal and painful post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. In the workplace, people are stressed out. About 40% of people say they have high anxiety at work, Probably most alarming was reading that 50% or more of college students go to professional counselors to seek help for their anxiety issues. And I think something that's really sad for me is that women are twice as likely as men to struggle. Today, we're going to hear from Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth and King David in Psalm 131 about how to have a quiet heart. Mark and Connie Douglas have had ample opportunity to practice calming their anxious thoughts. We'll hear from them, too. But first up is my friend, Janet Mylan. She's a member of the creative team that first brought True Girl to life back in 2003. She's a lead teacher on the True Girl tour and has authored some books for the brand, including the very popular one-year mother-daughter devos. Lately, Janet's been executing the production of our latest touring event for tween girls and their moms, debuting next month, the True Girl Crazy Hair Tour. It teaches girls to be courageous and stand for truth in a culture that will think they're crazy for doing it. You know, standing for truth, that's something that can cause some anxiety these days. Well, Janet's no stranger to anxiety. Not too long ago, she joined me in the studio to talk about ways to overcome it. Here's a portion of that conversation. One of the choices that I love that you made is that you turned to the Word of God. Mm. And you began to ask, what does God say about my anxiety? And some of the stuff you found was really groundbreaking in terms of me understanding my moments of anxiety. What did you discover in God's Word? Well, as I just stated a little bit, I just keep seeing in the Word things like, do not worry, do not be anxious. Philippians 4 and Luke 12, and in Matthew, there's just various places where it says, don't do that. Hmm. Don't be anxious about anything. And that's confusing sometimes because when you wake up in the middle of the night in a panic attack, it feels like, how do I not do that? Mm -hmm. So that led me to start researching into what choices I have in regard to anxiety. Because the Ten Commandments, do not murder, do not lie, those are easier ones to say, okay, I cannot do that. But do not be anxious. Uh, I think I'm just going to hold on to that one. <laughs> this seems <Yeah>. impossible. <laughs> and, and believe I can't control it. Right. Right? Right. And while there are some aspects of it that appear to be out of my control, the choices I make in the midst of it help me regain control over mm-hmm. my thoughts and my mind. Because he's like filled scripture with imperatives. Mm-hmm don't do this. Don't give in to the anxiety. Don't give in to the fear. Right, right. And I have definitely have learned that fear is, is there, and there's some things you do in spite of your fear. And some fear saves our lives. <laughs> Those are mm-hmm. good things. Yeah, right. But um, running from a bear. Right. That's good. <laughs> that's a good, good fear, run from the bear. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but with anxiety, one night I was just sitting there, and I remember so clearly I felt this overwhelming anxiety coming towards me in the midst of having just lost mom, particularly. And I just realized I was at a crossroads where I could Mm. choose to hurl into the pit or not. Knowing God's love for me would be there no matter what my choice was. Mm. But I knew in that moment I had to do hard work so I wouldn't go into the pit again. 
because I was not willing to let myself do that. And so then a big part of it for me is when I was researching just the concept of anxiety, I had just been through a tremendous season of grief, Mm -hmm. which was just loss after loss and having to grab on to the reality of how life actually was. That's what grieving was like, well, my mom is gone. This is my new reality. I need to understand that and move forward. And my friend committed suicide. I have to know that and move forward. And I realized when I was in anxiety, I was creating losses Mm. that had never happened and forcing myself to grieve over them. Explain that. Well, for instance, when I found out my dad had a heart attack, I was getting ready to go on stage to lead worship at a local event. And he left me a voicemail. I had a heart attack, which oh. sounds comical now to say it that way. But just to set the stage, he told me he had a heart attack. He's going in for tests. So clearly he was doing okay when you know he was mm-hmm. able to have a conversation. My temptation was to immediately go to my dad is dying, mm. which there was no indication of that. But that was my temptation. So anxiety was saying, your dad's dying. You need to grieve that loss now. Wow. But that wasn't the truth. So when I realized that I was trying to force myself to grieve over a loss that had not happened, Mm. I went to my friend who was beside me, and she spoke truth to me. Your dad is exactly where he needs to be. He's doing okay. He's getting treatment. And I was like— Okay. Those things are true. Right. And that made me think about, actually, oddly enough, manna in the Bible. Mm. (laughs) And I always refer to it as like holy bisquick because (laughs) apparently they did all kinds of things with it. They fried it. They put it into patties. I Uh, imagine they did a Snickers bar (laughs) and deep fried them. I don't know. (laughs) All kinds of things. And it's so clear that they were to go out and gather manna for the day. Mm. Now, with the exception of the day before the Sabbath, they gathered enough for two days so they didn't have to work on the Sabbath. And if they did gather more than they needed for that day, the manna would rot. Mm. And not like, "Mm, can we eat this turkey or not kind of rot. It was like (laughs) worms. Salmonella. Yeah. (laughs) Really bad. (laughs) Yes. So it occurred to me then, I I thought about in Lamentations when it talks about great is his faithfulness, his mercies are new every morning. And I thought— It occurred to me that I have enough mercy, enough manna, enough grace for this day. Mm. There's enough dew on the grass for this day. Wow. And those are things I would speak out loud over myself and still do sometimes. When I'm tempted to give in to the anxiety, I say, I have enough grace and mercy Mm. for this moment, this day, this task, This is what I'm equipped for. Mm. And if this thing I imagine might happen happens tomorrow, then I will have enough grace to deal with that day, that moment, that task. And I realized I was trying to collect manna for days that hadn't even happened yet. Uh, Such a helpful reminder from Janet Milan. There are a lot of dynamics at play in anxiety professional counseling might be needed. Even at times, medication could be helpful. But one essential ingredient in overcoming anxiety is that we need to speak the truth, God's truth, to ourselves. Mark and Connie Douglas learned that in a time of intense testing, and God used Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth as part of that learning. Connie had a surprising diagnosis. She was getting checked out after a car crash when the doctor told her she had cirrhosis of the liver. That surprised her because, as she put it, That's what alcoholics got. A small number of liver patients who have cirrhosis have a genetic-autoimmune factor that could be the cause. That was probably why the disease was present in my body. Connie's need for a liver was extremely serious, but the cirrhosis of the liver also developed into a secondary problem. Porto pulmonary hypertension. I went in every 7 to 10 days to be drained of fluid because I was so swollen. It was 2 to 3 liters of fluid drained every 10 days. I could not walk without assistance. I was very, very weak. She started losing weight. She was wasting away even though she was swelling up. I just was too weak to do anything. And so it was emotionally terrible to see, but we had a peaceful confidence that it could only be explained 
by God. Mark and I went to the Lord, and I went to the Lord, and I said, Lord, it's irrelevant why I have this. It doesn't matter. <laughs> what it does matter to me is how do you want me to walk through this? How can I walk through this? It's hard. It's very hard. And he actually gave me the 23rd Psalm, which is a very well-known psalm. Usually you hear it at funerals. But to me, it was a roadmap of how to follow Jesus through life. And he always would lead you for his righteousness sake. And he would always lead you to when you need refreshment to steel waters, to nourishing green fields, the Word of God, He would protect you, He would sustain you, and when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you didn't have to be afraid, and you knew you were secure in Christ, and His presence was tremendous during that time, and still is. One of the hardest parts of walking through this illness for Connie was watching her son grow up and not being able to engage with his new family the way she would have liked. That's where your heart aches the most. (sighs) Yeah, it's when your child, you know, he's a grown-up, but he's still my boy. And he had given us a granddaughter. So, of course, your heart, as a mom, as a grandmother... You don't want them to worry about you. You don't want them to suffer because you're suffering. And you want to be around. You want to be around for all those, you know. And actually, I was very sick when he got married. But the grace of God gave me energy. I planned his whole wedding. We had it at the at our favorite spot at the beach. Um, it was just lovely. And God graced me with that time. And, and then... You know, then the baby is born, and I'm just beyond. It's the best experience I've ever had as being a grandmother, and I'm so grateful for it. But yes, my illness, there's where the grief comes in sometimes is when I want to be there. I I would be frustrated because I couldn't engage with them like I wanted to or with Ellie like I wanted to. Her name is Ellie Rose. I'll tell you what, if you feel that you have to understand and make sense of everything that's going on in your life, you will drive yourself crazy trying. Of course, the pandemic hits. I went home from work to work from home in March of 2020. Uh, and sometimes shortly thereafter, actually, it was it was uh, Nancy's, one of her podcasts. Listen, if God is with you, if He's around you, if He's your fortress, if you have His presence in your life, you don't have to understand everything. You can... Be still. In this case, it was Psalm 131. This passage has been a life preserver for me. And I I heard some of that because I was home. And it really struck me um, that uh, no matter how smart I am or how much research I do or how many people I talk to, it's way too big for me. I won't figure it out. You will never see or understand all the purposes that God has for what He does in your life. She talked about being like a child weaned. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. That parent will take care of everything. Whatever you need, that parent's got it. And I think that image was very real to me many, many times, many, many times. I needed to be like that little little baby, uh, trusting God uh, and, and leaning my head on God's shoulder and just trusting. I don't know what you may be facing today or something that you're not even aware of that you'll be facing in the days ahead. Connie remembers being drained of energy, unable to get out of her chair, when a series aired on Revive Our Hearts. It was called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. But my prayer is that God will use Psalm 46 to stabilize your heart and to give you His perspective on the storm that you may be facing. And during that critical time, I listened to that whole series and rejoiced in the Lord, and it, it just built my faith so much, and it cheered me on in the depths of very, very 
big unknowns. Let me encourage you to sing while you're in the storm. Before you even experience his deliverance or can imagine where it's going to come from. Oh, it just fortified me. It encouraged me. It built me up. Yeah. In fact, when I meet Nancy, I'm probably going to just burst into tears because it helped so much. Um, it was, I can't, I don't know how to express how grateful I was and am for that, that time period. And I listened to it more than once. God said, I will be exalted. When you sing, you say, amen. I believe that's true. Singing is a very important thing. Singing to God. When you are suffering, crying out to God and worshiping God and abiding, just abiding and hiding in His shelter, that's where you've got to go. Well, that was Mark and Connie Douglas, good friends of Revive Our Hearts. It's encouraging to hear that we're not alone in the fight against our fears and anxious thoughts. God's Word truly is powerful for fighting our anxieties. But you and I need to get better at, as Nancy puts it, counseling our own souls with Scripture. You know, I spent the better part of 2022 using Scripture to counsel my soul. You see, I suddenly faced a severe battle with anxiety following an illness that disabled my ability to fall and stay asleep. I would wake suddenly and fearfully. And that fear lasted a good long time each night until I started to fight it with the words of God. I began counseling my heart with truth in the quiet of the night. And when I did that, the battle didn't end. But I did fall back to sleep within minutes. It works. You know, Mark Douglas mentioned listening to a series Nancy taught on Psalm 131. In fact, let me read that psalm to you, and then we'll hear some comments from Nancy about verse 2. The whole psalm, only three verses. It's a psalm of David. He wrote, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Here's Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth talking about one key to overcoming anxiety, and that's calming and quieting ourselves like weaned children. How to have a quiet heart. The psalmist says, I have quieted myself. And that is so often what we need in this very busy, frantic, hectic world that we live in. How do you get a quiet heart? Well, I see in this verse that to have a quiet heart requires a conscious choice. It doesn't just happen. He says, surely I have behaved and quieted myself. I've made a decision. I've been proactive about this. I have spoken to my heart. That's where we need to learn to counsel our hearts, to say, heart, be quiet. It's a conscious choice. Surely, he says, it's like he's taking an oath. Uh, One writer on this psalm said he is bound and determined to wrestle down his unruly soul. And I like that because sometimes my soul really gets unruly. Now, one thing I'm learning and I see it in this psalm is that you have to quiet your own soul. No one else can do it for you. And we tend to want somebody else to come around us and fix it or help it or make it better. And people can encourage us. They can point us to the Lord. But ultimately, we have to say to our own soul, soul, be quiet. Be still. Wait on the Lord. And this quietness is something that takes place within our hearts. You know, we tend to think if the things outside of me, if the external circumstances in my life would change, if my husband would just whatever, or if I just had a husband, or if my children would just, or if our house were just in a different place, or it were a different size, or if my job were just this, or if my boss were just this, or if just this would happen, then I wouldn't feel so much in turmoil inside. But you know, the storm really is within our own hearts. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. It's a change that has to take place within because I've learned you can change all kinds of circumstances in life, but your heart still be in turmoil. And you can have all kinds of turmoil going on around you and still have a quiet heart because peace is a matter of what goes on inside the heart. So I'm finding what I have to do to my own heart is say, be quiet, hush. 
Now, we tend to think sometimes that we don't have any control over our own heart, that we can't help how we feel. We can't help the way we're feeling or thinking. There's a book that has been such a blessing to me over the years, and I've read it uh, at different seasons in my spiritual pilgrimage. I'm reading it again because I need it again. It's by a an old-time mystic, an old-time Christian writer named Francois Fenelon. It's called The Seeking Heart. It's one of my very favorite devotional books. The devotions are all just one or two or three pages, and you can just read read it in small doses. And one of the things that Fenelon says in this book about this matter of not being able to control our thoughts, he says, ask God for calmness and inner rest. Then he says, I know what you are thinking, that controlling your imagination does not depend on yourself. Excuse me, please, but it depends very much on yourself. He says, when you cut off all the restless and unprofitable thoughts that you can control, you will greatly reduce those thoughts which are involuntary. God will guard your imagination if you do your part in not encouraging your wayward thoughts. We have to kind of rein in our souls and take charge under the control of the Holy Spirit and say, soul, be still. Mind, be still. Don't let your mind go there. I will not exercise myself in things too high or things that are too great for me. He says, I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. You think about a nursing infant that's dependent on its mother's milk, its mother's breast. But there comes a point as that baby grows, as it matures, that it needs to be weaned from the mother. But as you know, if you've weaned a child, weaning is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not always easy. And at points, it involves a struggle. I can't live without this. I need my mother's milk. I need the mother's breast. And so that child in the weaning process may whimper or cry. Something's being taken away that it thinks it can't live without. The child that has not been weaned or the child that's in the weaning process at times can be demanding. It has to be its way. And, you know, it's inherent in infants and in grown-ups who think like infants to be wired to think, I want and I want now, and not to be satisfied until you give it exactly what it wants. But once the child has been weaned, the picture is that it's content. The child is content with whatever the mother provides. The child is settled. The child trusts that the mother will give what the child needs. Now, it's not just infants that have to be weaned. We have to be weaned too. Grown-ups, children of God, as believers, as we grow spiritually, God begins to wean us from things that we think we can't live without. Things, comfort, the longing for life to work. That's a childish instinct to say, life has to work the way I want it to work and now. And God has to wean us and bring us to the place where we can live without those things we were dependent on as spiritual children. That's Nancy DeMoss Walgamu sharing some thoughts on Psalm 131, verse 2. You can hear the entire series when you go to reviveourhearts.com slash weekend and click on this episode. It's called Overcoming Anxiety. Speaking of overcoming, that's a concept Jesus gave to several of the churches he addressed in the opening chapters of the book of Revelation. Nancy is teaching on that in coming weeks on our daily radio program and podcast, Revive Our Hearts. And this month, as a thank you for your donation of any amount, we'll send you the booklet, Overcomers, Lessons from the Churches of Revelation. Think of it as an application guide you can use as you read through the first several chapters of Revelation. It's a way to personalize those letters from Jesus. You can give a gift by calling 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. Or go to reviveourhearts.com slash weekend and click on today's episode. Today, we heard about overcoming anxiety. Next week, overcoming bitterness. I hope you'll join us for that. Thanks for listening today. I'm Dana Gresh, inviting you back for Revive Our Hearts Weekend. Revive Our Hearts Weekend, calling you to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness.